Well, what a great pleasure to welcome you to this latest installment in the partnership between the Bridging the Gap Initiative and New America to showcase recent policy relevant books in which we bring the author into conversation with a current or former practitioner. I'm Jim Goldgeier, Senior Advisor with Bridging the Gap, which is housed at American University. And my co-moderator is Alex Stark, Senior Researcher for the Political Reform Program at New America. We are delighted to welcome Ali Wine, Senior Analyst at Eurasia Group and author of the new book published by Polity, America's Great Power Opportunity, uh, Revitalizing U.S. Foreign Policy to Meet the Challenges of Strategic Competition. Ali will be joined by Fiona Hill, Senior Fellow at the Center on the U.S. and Europe at the Brookings Institution, and previously Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European and Russian Affairs on the National Security Council, and a former National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. National Security Council, National Intelligence Council. All right, Alex, over to you. And welcome everyone. And, and thanks to, especially to Ali and to Fiona for joining us for this conversation today. It's um, great to be discussing your new book and it's also incredibly timely. So I'm, I'm really glad we're able to have this conversation. Ali, you have created this, this distillation of the concept and, and discussion of the concept of great power competition with this book. Um, and I was wondering if you could start by talking about what you consider to be kind of the most important takeaways from uh, for policymakers and, and for scholars from your book. Well, first, uh, Jim and Alex, thank you so much for, uh, for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I only wish we were doing this in person. Uh, and Fiona, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I can't tell you uh, what an honor it is and a privilege it is to be engaging with you. And I can't even begin to imagine how many demands there are on your time. So when I found out that you would be able to join, I, I was just thrilled. So thank you so much. Um, so Alex, the, the core takeaway of the book is in many ways it's encapsulated in, in the title. So Great Power Opportunity, it's kind of a play on great power competition. The, the core argument of the book is that the United States should, tr should strive as much as possible to pursue a foreign policy that's affirmative, that's forward-looking and that isn't beholden to or driven by the, the actions of its two principal nation-state competitors. That's obviously China and Russia. And, and I hasten to note that obviously intensifying strategic frictions with China and Russia, they will inform US foreign policy. They should inform US foreign policy. They must inform US foreign policy. But informing US foreign policy is different than dictating it. And I try to make that distinction in the book between informing and, and dictating. I think that the United States, it's, it's both a challenge, but I think it's also an opportunity for the United States to articulate and pursue a foreign policy that speaks at least as much to its aspirations as to its anxieties, at least as much to what it promotes as to what it opposes. And so really, I, I think that the, the challenge for the United States uh, in dealing, not only in dealing with China and Russia, but also in conceptualizing the broader contours of its foreign policies to think about leaving aside China, leaving aside Russia, what is our aspiration for world order? How do we seek to achieve it uh, in partnership with our friends, uh, and also with while selectively competing with China and Russia, but essentially an affirmative vision of world order that isn't tethered to the decisions of its competitors. That's great. And Fiona, I'd love to hear um, maybe how how this resonates with your both your experience and your work and kind of your takeaways from the book. Yes, thanks. Sorry, just unmuting myself. You'd think we'd all be <laughs> really adept and very quick on the trigger with that, wouldn't we? I was just actually taking a couple of notes and then forgetting that I had to <laughs> move the, uh, you know, the, the cursor over there, which actually um, is in a way something of an analogy to what we're talking about here, because you know we have in a way muted uh, some of our other foreign policy perspectives by, as Ali's suggesting, focusing almost exclusively on Russia and China. And look at the way that now um, the debate is being framed about US support for Ukraine in the war uh, with Russia after Russia's invasion. It's like, are we, are we really supposed to be focusing so much on this when China is in fact uh, the major threat uh, to the US national position, an international position uh, to US domestic politics, given uh, Chinese um, penetration of uh, our intellectual property, for example, our sort of data, uh, the incursions uh, through um, cyber intrusions, or China's systemic rivalry and challenge uh, to the United States internationally. I mean, we focus on the fact that China uh, could uh, 
outpace us in the way that actually back in the 1980s we had a similar but uh, i would say a lower level obsession about japan it's just uh, been uh, transported you know slightly further north uh, uh, in this uh, context in the um, asia pacific region and I you know, very much uh, share Ali's view that this is actually uh, really um, instead of a, uh, and I said this in my own you know uh, blurb for the book, which I, I absolutely love this book, and I just want to again make a plug for everyone uh, to buy it, that this is instead of an anchor for our thinking about international affairs, a tether um, in, in, in the sense of um, something that's pulling us back from taking a 360 degree view of uh, our national security position and our foreign policy. And just, um, you know, the spirit of moving, you know, things along to get into a broader discussion, just take uh, the United States dilemmas right now with the summit of the Americas. We seem to have mismanaged our relationship with Mexico and with other countries in our own hemisphere to such an extent uh, that the Mexican leader does not want to attend. And I think that that is also reflective of the point that um, we often look at the uh, policy initiatives in um, other regions, including our own, through the prism of our own domestic politics, obviously, but also through the prism of that great power competition. And a further example of this is something that I witnessed when I was in the National Security Council, as opposed to in the National Intelligence Council previously, was when we faced the crisis in Venezuela, when Nicolas Maduro <clears throat> refused uh, basically to secede the presidency, even having, you know, to all intents and purposes uh, and, uh, you know, effectively being voted out by the people of Venezuela and affected a self coup and decided to stay in place. And when we, the United States, were working with European allies and regional partners uh, in the Western Hemisphere to try to affect a coalition that would put pressure on Maduro to at least cede transitional authority to Juan Guaido and uh, the uh, other opposition forces. And we found that time and time again, many of our um, uh, regional interlocutors were not on the same page as us. And in fact, Russia, China and Iran uh, started to be part of this action as well. And we started to see the whole issue through the prism of that great power competition, especially with Russia and China. And in fact, it got to such an extent that at one point the Russians were positing to the United States a kind of weird swap between Venezuela and Ukraine. The idea that after they had sent in a hundred specialists and signals intelligence to help um, Nicolas Maduro fend off the United States and any potential interventions, that as they were now in our backyard in uh, the Western Hemisphere, then perhaps we would contemplate pulling out of their backyard uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. And I and a number of other colleagues had to actually fly out to Moscow to put an end to this discussion. But it just illustrated the problem of having things framed in great power competition, because it also means that Russia and China and other countries who would like to be part of that competition or like to have gains out of it, start to also figure out where they have to maneuver themselves in that larger geopolitical context to get our, either get our attention or to kind of wrest concessions you know, out from us. We're seeing that happening with Turkey um, in terms of NATO and NATO expansion in Europe because of the, um, the facts on the ground having change in European security as a result of Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine. And we're also now seeing, and I think this is part of the discussion that we're going to have and uh, where Ali picks up at the end of the book that, I, you know, you had to write rather quickly, given the way uh, that events were changing uh, so fast uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February, the way in which all countries are actually looking about what their reactions to Ukraine should be within the prism of their relationships with the United States, with Russia and with China now as well. And I think that that um, underscores more than anything else the dilemmas that Ali uh, uh, hones in on uh, with uh, such great insight and depth uh, in the book about having uh, a foreign policy framed by great power competition rather than having a holistic 360 degree view of the world and of our place in it and of our larger sets of interests. That's awesome. Thank you to both. Um, Ali, one of the important things about your book, you know, we often say China and Russia, um, these are very different countries. Uh, and I think one of the helpful things about your book is reminding us that these are different countries. And I think it's helpful to get into, I mean, Fiona's just talking about the Summit of the Americas, and I noticed, you know, um, President Biden once again talked about sort of democracy under threat and democracy versus autocracy. You know, one of the issues that arises is the whole question of sort of the international system, the US-led international system. Uh, you know, this administration talks a lot about the rules-based international system. Um, 
You have a very interesting discussion in the book about Chinese and Russian perspectives on this, where you argue that that China, with a stake in a lot of aspects of the system, um, wants to strengthen its influence uh, in the existing international system. But um, and so, in that sense, it's a revisionist power. But it doesn't want to dissolve uh, this system. It wants to strengthen its 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 uh, its influence and just want to hear you discuss a little more about what that means for foreign policy and and would love to hear from Fiona, Fiona, your views on how different Russia's view of the international system is. I mean, does Russia, Russia seems eager just to, to sort of crash the, the system. Uh, and is that, um, is that in fact the case? But Ali, we'll start with you and especially on sort of how the Chinese, how you think the Chinese are thinking about the international system and what that means for US foreign policy. Thanks, Jim. So I mean, here's a dilemma for China. So China, on the one hand, I mean, it routinely invades against the present configuration of the post-war order. It says, if you look at prominent Chinese international relations scholars, if you look at top ranking Chinese officials, they say that the current configuration of the post-war order is overly Western centric and really especially overly US centric. Uh, it reflects uh, antiquated geopolitical constructs. It doesn't reflect the emerging distribution of power, uh, power. So they routinely invade against the system. And yet when pressed, they are the first ones to, well, maybe not the first ones to concede, but they do eventually concede that outside of the United States, which country has been the principal, principal beneficiary of integration into that system? It's none other than China. And so how do you simultaneously, it's a dilemma for China, how do you simultaneously agitate for piecemeal revisions to a system of which you have been the principal beneficiary? And if, let's say hypothetically, just positing a thought experiment, if the post-war order, however one conceptualizes it, if it were to dissolve precipitously, disintegrate tomorrow, the United States would, of course, suffer inordinately, but China would suffer too. Uh, China depends inordinately on its integration into core post-war Bretton Woods institutions. It depends inordinately on its participation in globalization, despite now its, its shift towards dual circulation and sort of more inward uh, looking economic focus. Um, so China does have a stake. So it's, it's trying to strike this balancing act. How do you agitate for piecemeal revisions, but also maintain a sway and be seen as someone who is constructively building up that system. It's a very difficult balancing act. Uh, Russia, of course, and obviously I'm, I, we're in the company of the world's foremost authority. So I, I, anything I say on Russia, I, I defer entirely. Um, but what I would say about Russia is I think that Russia feels much less of a sense of integration into that system. It feels much more aggrieved. And I think one of the risks that, um, and so it's interesting, one of the risks that China presents is by virtue of its integration into the post-war order, it can use, and this is uh, Stacey Goddard, I think makes a really, really compelling point about embedded revisionism. When you are deeply embedded in a system, uh, you have more institutional leverage with which to revise it. So that's one form of, of influence, and I think kind of a unique challenge that China poses. Russia, uh, Russia poses more of, I think, a sort of a destabilizing source of, of influence. And I think that Russia's sense is, it's almost nihilistic in a way. That if we aren't, if, if the West or if the, the underwriters of the present system, if they're going to exclude us, then we're going to prove our influence, not by trying to integrate ourselves into that system, but by trying to collapse it from the outside. And I think that what we're seeing, particularly with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I think it's a very visceral, brutal example, is that when a nihilistic mindset guides a country of Russia's proportions, it becomes a very formidable source of influence. So I think that there is, so I think that China and Russia, they pose distinct challenges to US national interests. They pose distinct challenges to the configuration of the international system. Um, just one last point that I, I, I wanted to make and then I'll stop. Um, you know, Fiona mentioned in, in her initial observations, uh, a really key interplay that I, I suspect that we'll touch on for the duration of the conversation, um, this inextricable linkage between foreign policy and, and domestic policy. And, um, and one of uh, Fiona's observations, and I, and I quote uh, this observation in the book, um, for me, the further that I, the further that I researched the book, the further that I wrote the book, the more convinced I became that China and Russia, while formidable competitors, multifaceted competitors, competitors that are likely to endure, that they are manageable competitors. Uh, and that the United States, I think if it holds its own, if it invests in its own renewal, it can, it can manage China and Russia. But as the book progressed, I actually became more and more concerned about America's domestic politics. Um, and Fiona renders an observation, I believe that this was in an interview, it was sort of an extended profile slash interview in the New Yorker. Um, and Fiona rendered an observation in this interview that really just stopped me in my tracks. Uh, and Fiona was reflecting on 
you know, Russia's electoral interference uh, in the United States and how Russia has kind of lodged itself in the American psyche and, and said, at this point, uh, the Russians don't have to do an additional thing. They have now so thoroughly lodged themselves in America's psyche and Americans are so now focused on tearing themselves apart that Russia can just sit and watch. And so I think that as we reflect on great power competition, and we not only need to think about the external front of that competition, how does the United States manage a resurgent China and Irvantist Russia, which pose uh, distinct challenges, but also how do we ensure uh, that America is internally resilient? Because if America doesn't possess that internal resilience, that internal sense of cohesion, I think the questions of sustainably competing externally almost become moot. And I would just say, if there's anybody who has yet to read uh, Fiona's book, there's nothing for you here. I can't imagine there's anybody who still hasn't read it yet, but if you haven't, um, I recommend it highly for her uh, insights into the evolution of, of the UK, the US and uh, of Russia. Fiona, over to you. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, um, Ali's analysis is spot on as it is throughout this book, uh, just to be clear. And I also want to um, really highly recommend uh, this uh, to people to read as well for really helping to frame the current dilemma in our foreign policy. And I want to pick up on, you know, two issues that kind of also illustrate this problem. And then, of course, you know, respond uh, on the Russian front, because um, uh, Ali is exactly right about, you know, the Russian approach. But I was also, you know, thinking again about Mexico. And not just in the context in which I raised it, but it just gets to domestic policy, as Ali is um, uh, talking about. I mean, most of our policy toward Mexico and other countries further south, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, etc., is really focused on immigration and the southern border. And it's about our own domestic preoccupations and the fact that we haven't resolved uh, all of those issues for ourselves as well. It's also then focused, obviously, on drugs and guns. Uh, you know, we have a colleague at uh, Brookings, Van der Felbab Brown, who uh, basically specializes in drugs, guns and thugs, <laughs> organized crime as well, and also looks at the way that that is also shaped by our domestic politics and then the foreign policy consequences of that. And I observed, you know, while I was in the NSC, this wasn't obviously my portfolio, but that there wasn't a policy to grab onto in terms of when it came to the Western Hemisphere. We had the trade relations with Canada and Mexico and uh, the efforts to uh, turn NAFTA into the US um, MCA, Mexico, Canada, new trade relationship. But when it came to the foreign policy, it just wasn't clear that we had an angle. An autocracy versus democracy isn't going to um, uh, be sufficient when we look at the complexities of what's happening in the Western Hemisphere. And again, you know, this issue of then, well, China is in there now in terms of energy interests, uh, for example, or investments. We saw this in Venezuela and heavily invested um, in the energy sector there, as well as, you know, other trade relationships. Iran, you know, in on the mix, particularly with terrorism, you know, in, in the past in places like Argentina and elsewhere, and Russia trying to get a foothold, as it always has done, you know, through various old style um, linkages between the security services, but, you know, kind of going back historically that we've all lost sight of and people forgetting that Leon Trotsky got refuge in Mexico for a good reason, because there were ties between the Bolsheviks and, you know, the Mexican uh, socialist uh, parties, uh, nascent socialist parties back in the day. We've just lost sight of our own region where others haven't because others see this now as an opportunity for them if we're being inattentive. And, you know, this becomes, you know, part of uh, the, the issue that Ali is emphasizing as well. If we don't get a grip on our own domestic issues and our neuroses and the things that are tearing us apart, it's, it's going to be playing out more and more in our international uh, arenas, including close to home, not just with Russia and China and elsewhere and them trying to take advantage of it. And as I said, the Russians have taken advantage of it in spades, uh, especially in 2016 when uh, we had the interference in our election, finding us acutely vulnerable. Now that gets to, you know, kind of Russia and their interference in 2016 was also predicated on the fact that they want to blow everything up, including us. They wanted to show the United States to be full of hubris, the United States to be no better than anyone else, and the United States to be not fit to be the leader of the rules-based international system. It wasn't that because they want to change the rules, as you're talking about in, in the case of China. I thought that was um, a really um, good term about um, embedded revisionism. As you pointed out, Russia does not feel integrated because if you think about the whole uh, Cold War and um, post-Cold War environment, uh, China got really f much further ahead of Russia in that global economic integration. And of course, that was the post-Chanaman Square um, uh, issues where 
China already under Deng Xiaoping had put the bet on not political change, but on economic change. And then that drove uh, the integration. And Russia floundered and has that lost decade of the 1990s. And Russia's integration um, is also only partial after the 1990s uh, with the changes in the economy, because it's really through the prism of oil and gas where China becomes a massive manufacturing power, not perhaps on the heavy industry part of the towering and commanding heights of um, industry, although it starts to develop that as well, but really on that whole manufacturing sector of light industry, which it gets himself becoming the manufacturing center for the world on so many different things, from everything from rubber ducks to highly sophisticated components and, and, and computer chips. And so China does become, as you said, thoroughly embedded. And of course, it does all the things that you want to do. But Russia just never feels that. Russia feels also that it has lost as a result of uh, the end of the Cold War, where China, on the contrary, feels that it's gained something. Uh, so you have to also see now China does, of course, feel that it lost Taiwan, you know, going back uh, to the 1940s and uh, to the whole upheavals after World War II. But China really does feel itself to be one of the victors. Now, the Soviet Union felt itself to be one of the victors of World War II. But post-Soviet Russia, as the successor states, feels itself to be a victim and becomes, in its view, this is Putin and the people around him, a victim of that rule-based order because it doesn't have a special place in it. And the United Nations isn't sufficient. And because its economy is lagging so far behind, you know, we always talk about its trade relations with, you know, the United States being <clears throat> the size or the equivalent of Costa Rica, you know, back in the past where China and the United States are really, um, you know, both dominant players in each other's economies and also in the broader global economy. Russia always feels like it's kind of second class. And absolutely, if it's not going to be first class, if it's not going to be on the board of the, the club, then it wants to blow it up and then set the rules on its terms. And that's what we're seeing with Ukraine. It's a way of blowing up first and foremost the European security system and demanding that now it's done on Russia's terms and by extension, because this has become such a pivotal conflict, and actually would have been even if it had gone as Russia intended in those first few weeks of February, where it had, you know, basically overturned the European security order by seizing territory, you know, in the first, um, you know, major effort to do so since World War II, remembering, of course, that they actually already did that in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass, and we seem to have just glossed over all of that. Russia would really have been in the driver's seat because Putin wants to see himself like Stalin. He wants, you know, people like Churchill uh, to come to Moscow with notes saying, you know, percentages not of trade, but of, of territory and uh, encapsulating for the world Russia's dominant position in Europe and then by extension being one of the super players, not just one of the regular players. And that's, you know, kind of part of another aspect of great power competition. It doesn't leave room for everyone else. And if the definition of great powers, which is what Russia is trying to say, is it's Russia and China, maybe the United States, but maybe not. But I mean, this is what Putin and those guys say. Where's everyone else? And I, and I think as China felt before when they were everyone else and didn't like that very much because they didn't feel, you know, until 2010 and the dramatic economic rise because everybody else was sinking somewhat after the global financial crisis and then with the increase in their military might. Now, the weird thing, I guess, that China is trying to come to terms with is the fact that they are now um, one of the big guys with rules um, setting capability, but it's still the kind of question of where does everybody else fit in? Um, I have a, another question kind of linking the international and domestic, but oh, actually before that, I just wanna remind the audience that you can submit your questions to us uh, via Slido, you'll see it on your screen. Um, we'll try to integrate those into the conversation as much as, as, much as possible. But um, uh, Ali, so you, you argue in, in the book that the US ought to pursue a kind of selective competitive foreign policy where you know identifying cases where um, limited cooperation or limited competition with Russia and China could further US interest in the world. And I'm curious about how you think about this uh, within the, that framework that Jim mentioned of a, of a global competition of democracies versus autocracies that the Biden administration in particular has advanced um, and, and how we should, or how we ought to maybe think about how we you know, cooperate and maybe affirm ties, but without sacrificing democratic values. And then um, Fiona, I'd also love to hear from your perspective, what, what do you think is possible in terms of cooperation, especially um, you know, now with regards to Russia and its aggression in, in Ukraine over, over the long term as this competition 
heightens, um, is there room for cooperation alongside competition and, and kind of what does that look like? Thanks, Alex. And, and, and let me begin my answer by saying, but whatever I'm going to say is going to be highly impoverished because it's, it's, such, an ex, it's such an extraordinarily important question. It's a really difficult question, too. Um, two, um, two very, very impoverished thoughts, but I hope that I can kind of stitch those together in a somewhat coherent answer. Um, the first part is, uh, in terms of you know, the, the framing, uh, I would say, and again, I, 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 I perhaps risk sounding overly sanguine, um, I think that the narrative that Sort of we live in this increasingly illiberal age that autocracies are sort of on the sort of stealing a march. It's reminiscent of sort of you know, the 1930s and democracies are on their, their heel. You can understand why that narrative has gained traction, but I think that the decisions that China and particularly Russia have rendered, I think in many ways prove that narrative to be at a minimum overstated. I mean, so look at, so, so just briefly look at China and Russia. Uh, I remember, I mean, we all remember the narrative. So if you rewind the clock, so let's say March or April of 2020, what were the narratives at the time? So leaving aside Russia, but what were the narratives at the time? The narratives in March and April 2020, China has successfully contained the first wave of the coronavirus pandemic at home. It has successfully contained the initial wave of economic fallout from COVID-19. And now having demonstrated its bureaucratic and administrative competence, unlike this flailing, floundering United States, it's now training its sites outwards and it's dispatching teams of doctors to countries in distress. It's shipping uh, kits of personal protective equipment to countries in distress. What was the narrative about the United States? The United States is being convulsed by a fast moving pandemic. It can't get it under control. It's being convulsed by a recession. The economy is in free fall. We have protests against racial injustice. So the first quarter of 2020, there was this extraordinary uh, gap in the perception, the global perceptions of US competence and Chinese competence. And I remember thinking at the time, uh, China has this amazing opportunity, at least I thought that it did, but I think that it subsequently squandered that opportunity. Um, imagine if China in March 2020 or April 2020, given that juxtaposition of narratives, imagine if China had said, you know, we have the United States where we want it. Let's temporarily, not indefinitely, but let's temporarily press pause on intimidating Taiwan. Let's temporarily press pause on cracking down on Hong Kong. Let's take steps to stabilize relations with Australia, India, Japan, South Korea, major militaries and economies in our region. Let's take steps to get the comprehensive agreement on investment across the finish line with the European Union. Let's try to stabilize our relationship with the United States, which is now deteriorating on a bipartisan basis. I think that if China had taken any of those steps or that full combination of steps, I think we would be having a very, very different conversation. Where's China today? Uh, China today, now it's true, and I, and I don't want to, to diminish that fact, China is certainly more central to the global economy today than it was prior to the onset of the pandemic. But I think that the gap between its economic heft on the one hand and its diplomatic estrangement from advanced industrial democracies on the other hand has grown uh, markedly larger uh, in, the, in the interregnum. So that's in terms of foreign policy. And then on domestic policy, doubling down on zero COVID, uh, doubling down on cracking down on uh, major technology companies that are spurring uh, innovation, um, taking a lot of steps that are really, I think, undercutting the, the appeal of its model, if there is a, sort of a putative uh, China model. And then, of course, look at Russia. Um, you know, Russia with its invasion of Ukraine, which has to rank as one of the most extraordinary acts of strategic self-sabotage in the post-war era. Where is Russia now? We don't know how the war is going to end. We don't know the parameters of the resolution, but we do know that regardless of the timing of the end and the parameters of the resolution, Russia's military will have been substantially degraded. Its deterrence capacity will have been substantially degraded. Its economy is projected to contract by a little over 10%, and Russia is doubling down. And so on the first point, um, it's not clear over the course of the pandemic, one of the concerns that I think a lot of observers have is that over the past two, two and a half years, it's not clear how much President Xi and President Putin have just literally have just traveled outside of their respective countries. It's not clear uh, what kind of advice they're getting, who their advisors are, but they're doubling down on highly counterproductive policies that I think really place in the stark relief some of the limits to authoritarian rule. Now, limits to authoritarian rule don't mean validation necessarily of democratic rule. And so we obviously democracies, uh, it becomes that much more incumbent upon democracies to demonstrate that they can deliver, that they can address major socioeconomic challenges. In the United States, uh, it's staggering. The United States accounts for 4% of the world's population, but is far and away, it's roughly, I think a quarter or a fifth, I haven't checked the latest numbers, but roughly a fourth or a fifth each of global COVID-19 fatalities and infections. Uh, income and wealth inequality are rising. Uh, there are a number, we look at gun violence, there, there, there are a number of scourges that democracies have to address. So, so point one is, I think that the narrative of sort of authoritarian ascendance or resurgence is overstated, but it doesn't mean that democracies don't have their work cut out for them. So I think that's point one. Um, and then on the second point, and, and I will fully confess that when I drafted the afterword to the book, um, 
I, so I, I echo a point in the afterword to the book that I make in the body text of the book, but it was very difficult for me to do so. So I make the point in, in the main text of the book that the United States uh, won't be able to advance its vital national interests if it cooperates solely with like-minded countries, that in order to advance its own vital national interests, whether on slowing climate change, uh, dealing with pandemic disease, uh, upholding a, a feeble and perhaps uh, headed towards irrelevance non-proliferation regime, that it would only be able to do so uh, in full cooperation. Um, it was very difficult for me to sustain that point when I wrote the afterward, just in light of the cruelty that Russia was, was inflicting upon Ukraine. And yet, I tried very hard when I was writing the afterward to, to see if I could conceptualize a scenario in which the United States and its, uh, its European allies and Asian allies and partners, um, could they lock China and Russia away in a kind of strategic quarantine and say, look, given Russia's barbarity, it's unconscionable to deal with Russia. Given the deteriorating human rights landscape in China, it's unconscionable to deal with China. We'll lock them away in strategic quarantine, we'll organize a like-minded coalition, and we will be able to advance our vital national interests to the exclusion of Beijing and Moscow. I wasn't able to come up with such a scenario. And so still, uh, and this is a lesson from, from the Cold War as well, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were existential adversaries, and they engaged with one another, not out of, not with starry-eyed illusions, but they did so out of practical necessity. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a, a real wake-up call to Washington and Moscow that we have to cooperate, we have to establish hotlines, not because we have any affinity or love lost for one another, but for our own survival. And I think that similarly today, um, even as the United States holds its nose, even as the United States might turn away and shudder at the thought, as I shudder at the thought of cooperating even selectively with China and Russia, it isn't clear to me what the alternative is. And so one last point and then I'll stop. Um, and, and actually this is another insight of, of you know, Fiona's um, that, that really resonated with me. Uh, this was in an interview that Fiona gave to Ed Luce. And Fiona said, diplomacy, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing Fiona, obviously her eloquence is, is stratospheric. So I'm very crudely paraphrasing what Fiona said in, in, this, in this interview with Ed Luce. Uh, but Fiona, I'm paraphrasing her, said, um, diplomacy isn't just about talking with your friends. Diplomacy also means that you talk with competitors, you talk with adversaries, so long as you have note takers present. You need to have note takers present. If you're the US, your interlocutors need to have their note takers present. But the essence of diplomacy is not just is talking friends. The essence of diplomacy is making, having difficult conversations, achieving incremental progress uh, in the interests of shared vital national interests. I still don't see an alternative to doing that. If China and Russia were, uh, were, were bit-sized economies, bit-sized militaries that really didn't contribute much to the global strategic balance, that argument might become somewhat more tenable. But given China and Russia's aggregated economic and military proportions, I can't conceive of a scenario in which the United States and its allies and partners can lock them away. And importantly as well, to Fiona's point, when we look outside of the aperture of great power competition, the United States, China, and Russia, the vast majority of the world's countries, they wanna exercise agency beyond that framework. They recognize that they have to maintain their own dealings with China and Russia. And so I think that for all of those reasons, even as we hold our nose, we engage not out of affinity, we engage out of necessity. Well, I was taking note again, as I always do here. Yes, I think that was my, um, you know, appeal for note takers. You know, having uh, been one in many uh, different senses, because I can't remember the exact context of you know that discussion with it. But it's it's the act of taking note of what they're saying and why they're saying it and what they're actually doing. If there's a gap in between, and then you know, using that to inform, you know, your own way in which you're going to deal with pushing forward your interests, as you said, even if it's an incremental way, you've got to understand the constraints, the obstacles, um, what's actually possible and feasible um, in the kind of context in which others uh, are interacting. Uh, because uh, when Alex is asking that question about, is it possible to cooperate? I mean, it's I, I suppose cooperation, when we use that word, we think of something positive, you know, along with people who are um, basically, as you said, like-minded. We tend to think of cooperation between, you know, kind of groups of well-meaning, um, positive thinking, you know, like-minded people. But actually, sometimes you have to uh, cooperate in dire circumstances with people that you wouldn't normally contemplate doing that. I mean, I always think of a fire or, you know, another natural disaster. I mean, it doesn't discriminate on, you know, kind of people's backgrounds or identities or how they see themselves. You'll find everybody um, being in all of this together. And there are um, a whole host of dire existential issues where we either should have been cooperating or we absolutely will have to cooperate. Climate change is pretty much indiscriminate. I mean, it's affecting the entire planet, as, 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 as discussed. And although we may have to have local 
and uh, regional response is this. We might, um, for some of the issues, have to have a massive global response. I mean, why is it that all of Hollywood movies start with, you know, something massive invasion from outer space that sometimes gets everyone to work together but doesn't, or a, an asteroid strike, uh, uh, Don't Look Up, actually is an example of complete breakdown of any kind of cooperation. But there are others, you know, that are, that are more positive um, stories there because that's making the point for all of us that there are circumstances which we're going to have to find a way um, of moving forward. And I think there's been some quotes uh, really from, from some of those countries that are not part of the great power competition saying that it's all very well while China and the United States and Russia are fighting with each other, the world is burning. What about us? I mean, that's been in the context of food security and the extending drought and desertification in Africa and parts of Asia as well as the Middle East, for example. So cooperation to Alex's question about how that uh, looks like, it has to be in that frame, which Ali's talking about here. They can't be framed by, okay, well, if I cooperate with Russia on this thing, what does this mean on the other? Do I have to compartmentalise? Do I have to you know, you know, subsume um, my better judgment or uh, put my values to one side? It's, it's basically thinking about really critical issues where it's only through some degrees of cooperation that we can tackle them. I mean, the obvious ones are, of course, a pandemic. We did a really lousy job um, on the first phases of the pandemic in terms of our cooperation. You know, at this point, one would have hoped, if you think, look back at smallpox and polio and some of the other instances, and even HIV AIDS after a period of time, um, it took some time, of course, that we actually did get countries on the same page, drug-resistant tuberculosis, we've had international protocols. And, in fact, the development of the vaccines actually shows how important international cooperation was. And, and honestly, um, Russia and China could have been part of this, but they decided to be kind of a national approach uh, to vaccine development. And, you know, that I think is a huge mistake. And if we're thinking about the next pandemics, you know, just like we know now uh, African uh, countries are chiding us for getting panicked about monkeypox, which is something that they've been dealing with for a long time, and reminding us that, you know, so many of uh, these diseases come out of certain particular reservoirs, of um, uh, particularly country perspectives that they've been dealing with. And those can be scaled up. Then it's not just obviously Africa and Asia that the sources of pestilences and pandemics. The bird flu that turned into the 1918 um, so-called Spanish flu started in Kansas chicken farms. So this was, you know, in many respects, it was a global pandemic that sparked off in the United States uh, because of, you know, various... Uh, poultry uh, rearing practices that we actually still engage in. So, I mean, there is a scope here for um, cooperation through international uh, mechanisms to deal with existential crises like pandemics and climate change, which are, of course, intertwined. And then the question is, how are we creating institutional arrangements, multilateral arrangements for that? And that can't be just done through the prism of um, a great power competition. We're seeing the failings now of the UN system because we created... Uh, a situation where the UN Security Council, which was created, I mean, the Chinese are right on this, but it doesn't necessarily mean then that they should dominate it. Uh, but how do we deal with everybody else who's not part of this? But they are right. This is an antiquated setup from the end of World War II, with the so called victors of World War II, you know, sitting on top of the rest of the General Assembly. And we have to figure out how we bring everybody else with agency in. And one example, you know, of this would be. I mean, thinking about now the food security crisis that comes out of Ukraine uh, and the war and the Russian embargo. I mean, I, it's very disturbing to me that the head of the African Union went to Moscow to talk to Putin, the aggressor who has actually caused the food crisis, rather than actually through a UN framework or a larger international mechanism, uh, try to create an international response to this. Because an awful lot of the food programs are run through the UN in any case and other international multilateral organizations that feed um, uh, impoverished areas of Africa and the Middle East. And Ukraine is a major, obviously, uh, exporter, but also a provider of grain to those services. So m this is exactly what Putin wants. He wants to become uh, again, the setter of rules about who gets grain, for example. I mean, I think there is, you know, definitely a part of that desire to control Ukraine, to be able to control food supplies, because the largest producers of grain, I'm sorry, the United States, Canada, and you know, a small number of other countries, are in fact Russia, Kazakhstan, and uh, and Ukraine, and so many countries worldwide are almost entirely dependent on grain from those three sources. And Putin sees not only uh, the ab ability to control the spigot on energy, but another. Um, spigot of food and so um, we need to find a way and it's part of that competition because this is all about sticking it to the United States not about a larger international well-being he's using this to basically say pressure should be put on the United States to back off and get out of Europe because this is the United States that's doing this
not that this is a direct consequence of the war in Ukraine. So even on those issues, that's not cooperation, obviously, with Russia, but it ought to be larger international cooperation. We could cooperate with China on this, too, because China has a vested interest in the restoration of food security because China, too, is vulnerable here. Uh, this is one area where China is not at all self-sufficient, not in food, is also suffering from uh, desertification risks and uh, the effects of climate change. So thanks. So Ali, there are a couple of questions that have come in that follow directly on some of the things that, that Fiona was just talking about um, and related to sort of the idea of a rules-based order. So, so one of them, so Paul here asks, Biden highlights the rules-based order as the arena for strategic competition. Is there a global consensus on what that means and support for the US version? And Bruce Jenelson relatedly asks, uh, first he says kudos, uh, Ali, um, what would be the two to three rules-based order components that could get substantial global agreement, um, Global South too, and fit today's world? Thanks, Jim, uh, and and thanks, Paul, and uh, and and Bruce for the question. And and Bruce, thank you so much for for the kind words. They they really mean a lot. Um, there's no way that I could do justice to your question, so let me let me begin by stipulating that that caveat up front. Um, I think that any I'll I'll begin with the uh, sort of with Bruce's question. You know, what would sort of two or three components be? Um, and it my answer kind of reflects at least sort of common denominator approach. But I would hope. Um, so in terms of sort of what would a rules based order look like? Um, when we use, I, you know, we so often use the term, and, and I, I'm, I myself am very guilty of this kind of uh, sort of overusage. Um, when we think about, we use the term post-war order so often and so reflexively that we forget sort of its foundational significance. Um, we have a post-war order because the world suffered the scourges of two world wars, and there was a recognition. Um, Margaret Macmillan has a really powerful observation on this point. She said, after World War I, it was possible for diplomats to say, uh, let's start over uh, World War I. It was, it was a it was a horrific, um, it was a horrific, globally calamitous event, uh, but it wasn't so calamitous that diplomats couldn't say, let's start over again. Uh, and she says that after World War II, it became untenable. That proposition that we just need to, to tinker a bit with some of the, so, so World War I happens. Uh, we had then this period of the 1920s, which actually uh, Dr. McMillan states, uh, the 1920s, it's actually not remembered as much, were actually a time when there were a lot of really creative and, and potentially promising experiments in, uh, great power cooperation and institutional cooperation. She talks about the, the League of Nations, um, a number of other uh, treaties and arrangements. And then of course we had the Great Depression and then we had World War II. So after World War II, it became untenable to say back to, to back to normal. We needed a post-war order. So I would hope given the foundational significance of what it is that the post-war order is trying to achieve, first and foremost, avoid World War III. Secondly, avoid another Great Depression. I would hope I would hope, and if the answer is, is no on this, we really are at sea, but I would hope that there could at foundationally be an agreement that the most solemn objective of great power relations, leaving aside cooperation on transnational challenges, but the most solemn objective of great power relations must be the, the, to avert the repetition of great power war. I would hope that there would be some consensus on, uh, and a global consensus on, on that pillar, uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, uh, Fiona brings up the point about food insecurity. I would hope that food insecurity, uh, obviously right now Russia is weaponizing food insecurity, but I would hope uh, that outside of Russia, which is weaponizing this horrific humanitarian and uh, economic crisis for its own strategic, very, very uh, myopic strategic ends, I would hope that there will be a consensus that uh, Russia's weaponization of food insecurity, it highlights vulnerabilities in uh, supply chains. It highlights the need for collective resilience, uh, and it highlights the need to, to buffer ourselves, to, to strengthen ourselves against the weaponization of interdependence. That's uh, Henry Farrell and Abraham Newman's really compelling phrase from their international security piece a few years ago. So I would hope, I mean, food, um, the world cannot survive if it's hungry. The world cannot survive if there's perpetual food insecurity. So I would hope that some kind of galvanization or mobilization outside of Russia for the time being on, on the need for enhanced food security could be um, another pillar. Um, so th those are a couple of a couple of uh, ideas. And then on the on what sort of a rules based order means. Well, invariably, everyone is going to have a different conception. So the United States has one conception. China has its conception. Russia has its conception. Uh, but I I do think that you know perhaps a rules based order stemming from just some of those kind of first order priorities. Do we all agree 
that another great power war would be calamitous. I think it would be, I would hope, pretty widespread agreement. Do we agree that any rules-based order that is worthy of the name would be able to provision food and avoid uh, widespread famine? I would hope that there would be an agreement. So even though there are invariably going to be different conceptions, and we see the intensif intensification of strategic frictions bringing out those different conceptions into sharp relief, but I would hope that let's begin with kind of those, those uh, lowest common denominator, but fundamental you know, prerogatives and use those to inform uh, a rules-based order. Um, but certainly I'll, I'll make one last point and then I'll stop. Uh, I know it's become cliche to say that you know, we're present at the creation and this is the time for, for a new order, but uh, I think that in this case, uh, however cliched or hackneyed that expression or that conclusion might be, I think that there is something to, to recommend that judgment. I think that we are seeing it, and, and Fiona mentioned it in her previous remarks, we're just seeing glaringly the inadequacies of the present system. It's, and it's not just, I mean, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a very visceral example of the failures. Uh, you know, Tanisha Fuzzle talks about this very beautifully in her recent foreign affairs piece, and very urgently, how Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a first order test of some of the foundational norms of the post-war order. But predating Russia's invasion of Ukraine, look at our response to COVID-19. I remember when COVID-19 broke out, my thought was that COVID-19 would occasion the kind of emergency bilateral coordination between the United States and China that we saw when Lehman Brothers collapsed and precipitated a global financial crisis. Lehman Brothers collapses, we have this fast moving recession, the United States and China, they get together, they engage in emergency bilateral coordination, they activate the G20. Now granted, 2008 and 2009 were devastating for the global economy, but they could have been much worse. And yet, what did the pandemic do? The pandemic has made the, it has heightened nationalism, it has undermined support for global responses, it has undercut uh, institutional mechanisms to address transnational challenges. So. You look at Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you look at the response to COVID-19, you look at the global financial crisis, and it's clear that there's this growing gap between the present architecture and the present and future imperatives. And I would hope that some of those, I think, really increasingly apparent realities could drive some consensus, maybe not a full consensus, but a, a substantial consensus. But again, a, a very impoverished answer to two really important questions. So, uh, Paul and Bruce, thank you. Can, can I just add a couple of points to this? Because I thought what Ali said is just spot on. But there's just a couple of little uh, things that I wanted to mention as um, uh, as he was uh, speaking. It made me think about it. You know, I, public health, as you said, you know, Ali, and we've all said the pandemic really should have been this occasion. But I think it was that great power frame of competition because it starts, we think, in Wuhan in a live animal market and it gets covered up. And... You know, if it had been Ebola and it had somehow, you know, changed to become um, a, 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 a basically a, a, a pandemic of global proportions and the, the, the method of transmission had become airborne or, you know, kind of something more difficult, but it had come out of, you know, an existing skirt that's been there for some time, we would all have um, really rushed to do something. We did with MERS and SARS as well. But it's because it becomes associated with China, of course, you know, former President Trump that you know rather derogatory name about it i mean it, it's you know perhaps no accident that the uh, great influenza was called spanish flu when it what instead of kansas flu uh and and it, but it was because it became global very quickly before people were really realizing the origins of it in the multiple waves and yes there was an inadequate response there and of all kinds of reasons that you know we don't have to get into but we do have the systems in place we dealt with smallpox uh we've dealt with um polio uh, been dealing with TB and you know those keep coming you know back up again again our domestic politics are part of the problems of some of these issues because of resistance to vaccination uh, you know with measles and others returning but it's because it becomes associated in this great power frame that we have such a problem in dealing with it so it gets to your point exactly of how can we take it out of there and and the same thing with climate change is starting to get put in a great power frame as well. It's this whole idea, you know, the Russians get this idea they're going to benefit somehow from climate change. So why stop it? Because Siberia is going to become Florida and, you know, the kind of the, the new place to be, you know, the new sign of uh, place of viticulture, the new met Mediterranean climate. I mean, that's, you know, kind of preposterous. But in some cases, some of that thinking is there that maybe some countries will benefit over the others rather than that having that global commons approach. And that's become a feature now of those post-Cold War institutions, as you're suggesting, because they were set up by the victors um, of, of that war when we were starting again. And we, we, we've not created an adaptable system. And the question, I guess, it does have to be, do we start again or can we adapt what we've got? Because as you say, it's very hard to keep coming up with new ideas. And many of the ideas from the 1920s got uh, rolled over into some of the institutional ideas of the 1940s, but in just different formats. So can we reform what we've got 
or do we have to you know start all over again i think is you know as part of the question i think we can reform what we've got but it takes that larger will and how do we get there if we have everything framed in what if we do something here it'll actually help you and and, and remember the propaganda coming out of china and russia for talking down western vaccines I mean, that came back to hurt the, the Russians in spades, especially as Sputnik uh, and their vaccine, you know, perhaps if it had been done in an international cooperation as it came on a little bit later, may have been an effective part um, of um, the, the response. And China, if it had been, you know, kind of less nationalistic, I mean, may have also been able to be part of that and to help develop an actually more effective vaccine. Because we know that it's been, you know, somewhat ineffective, which has had the problems for the, and then their vaccination drive. We could have done this better. And we could, you know, for the next as well, but we have to have a take it out of that great power frame. Ali, I, I want to, if you don't mind, Alex, I, there's one other question here that's just been on my mind a lot that I wanted to um, get your thoughts on. It comes from Scott Moore. Um, great talk. Uh, how much potential do you see to harness the perception of threat from China to build support for domestic investment and reform? And it's on my mind a lot because I mean, pushing back against the kind of approach that you're taking is basically the incentive to take advantage of the bipartisan support for being tough on China to try to move things through, um, especially given how hard it is to get domestic legislation passed, but to use that threat to say, okay, this is why we need to do infrastructure or whatever the other um, particular things might be. And how do you see that? having a, 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 an effect on the kind of argument that you're trying to make here in the book. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and, and Scott, thank you so much. Uh, Scott has a book coming out very, very soon, uh, China's Next Act, and I, I can't wait to read it. I tweeted out about it. I, I can't wait to read it. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be a vitally important book. And thinking about how, you know, with China's sort of scientific and technological strides, you know, how do we balance um, how do we balance our, you know, competitive dynamics and, and cooperative dynamics with China? So, uh, so please do. Uh, you know, keep a look out for Scott's book. Um, I wrestled with this question a lot as well. And and the the answer, albeit I, I think perhaps an unsatisfactory one, but the answer that I, I came to in the book was that um, if we think about sort of a competitive toolkit, um, I see no reason why anxiety that is constructive, anxiety about external competitors that is constructively harnessed, I see no reason why one would object to that anxiety um, as one tool in, in a large toolkit. I don't think it should become a crutch. That's the point that I try to make in the book. So certainly, um, if the United States can harness competitive anxiety constructively to take steps that it should have been taking anyway, I think that that use of anxiety is, is very compelling. And Scott has actually written uh, you know, very powerfully. This is a piece, I think, from, from last year in Foreign Affairs uh, with Tarun Chabra, who's now uh, in the administration, and with Dominic Tierney. Um, and I think that they make this case very powerfully using uh, competitive anxiety as an instrument of uh, domestic renewal. Um, so it can be done. Uh, I don't think it should become a crutch. Uh, I would say a couple of other points. Um, one, one potential constraint is the extent to which we're going to be able to harness that competitive anxiety constructively given our intensifying domestic divisions. And I think that you know, Rachel Myrick has written very powerfully in this one. She actually, uh, she has a, a piece recently in an International Organization in which she explicitly tackles this question and says, to what extent will the United States be able to leverage this external, this sort of the fear of, of, of external competitor as an instrument of domestic renewal as an instrument of internal cohesion. And she renders a, a pretty a cautious and I think sober perspective. So um, one tool uh, as part of a broad toolkit, not as a crutch, um, recognizing that we have to get our own sort of house in order in order for us to be able to use that competitive anxiety um, in a constructive way. And then just one last point and then I'll stop. Um, I think it's really important, not only in terms of what we do here at home, but also the kind of signaling, uh, what message do we send to our allies and partners? Um, even even if we do invoke China and Russia and, and external competitors to get to get legislation passed to make certain investments, um, we shouldn't have to invoke them. Uh, we shouldn't have to invoke China or Russia to take care of our citizens' public health. We shouldn't have to invoke China or Russia and China and Russia to repair broken infrastructure to improve our system of uh, K through 12 education. Um, those are imperatives that we should undertake, not because of external competition, but because. We are, uh, we have an obligation as public servants for our citizens. And I thought President Biden, I think that this was on the, uh, the sidelines of the, the, the Glasgow Summit, the, the Glasgow uh, Climate Change Summit. And he was asked, um, you know, where do you see US-China competition fitting in vis-a-vis -vis climate change? And President Biden said very powerfully and very succinctly, he said, uh, 
we should be decarbonizing and we should be moving to mitigate climate change, not because of competition with China, but we want clean air for our grandchildren. And I think that that's about, that's a, that's a very, very compelling justification. So I think that Scott's point is absolutely right. One tool is part of a toolkit, but let's not use it as a crutch. And Fiona, did you want to weigh in on that as well? No, I think um, on most of these um, issues, Ali has, is just totally spot on. I mean, whenever I've just been provoked to add something, it's just uh, based on you know, what he's saying. I mean, I just can't say enough how um, useful you know this book is <clears throat> you know, for really getting us to push beyond this. I mean, I, I would just sort of say, you know, when I think back, you know, to, um, you know, how uh, when I was in the National Security Council and other people grappled with that as well, you know, there's always an imperative to create these strategic reviews and come up with a national security strategy. We do this frequently. I mean, we're always doing it. You know, every every administration does their own national security strategy, and that whole frame of great power competition is obviously very seductive. Uh, just like democracies versus autocracy, it kind of gives you uh, again a, a tool um, uh, to use, but it can't be the only the only driver for everything. It is just a frame of reference. And I mean, Ali, I think, has um, outlined so clearly here, and all the questions are, are, are basically moving towards uh, the same conclusion, that you know, a frame of reference is not then a, a deterministic driver of everything that you do and just cannot be. And in fact, there's great dangers inherent to this, as you know, Anne-Marie Slaughter you know, says um, on, on the blurb of the book. You know, it's just, you know, you can't just use this security blanket. We need to be doing some of these things, you know, all for ourselves, for all the inherently self-evidently right reasons. Well, I think we're almost out of time. Um, Ali, I just wanted to check with you before we wrap up, if you have any kind of concluding or, or final thoughts that you, you wanted to add. And, and I'll just mention that um, we'll send, we have all the questions and we'll send them to Ali and he can, he can get back to people uh, uh, separately outside of this session. Absolutely, I, and, I, and I will make sure to respond to all of them. Uh, only two concluding thoughts. Uh, first, uh, Jim and Alex, I, I think that this uh, this series that you've inaugurated, I think it's such an important series, you know, bringing together practitioners um, and, and academics to, to exchange ideas. So I mean, hats off to you on starting off this series uh, or inaugurating the series, and, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of it. Uh, I, um, before Fiona joined the call, we, you know, we were talking beforehand that just um, this book is a product of roughly you know, two and a half, three years of work. And I feel that honestly, just this one hour of conversation vastly outstrips uh, all of the perspectives that I gained in those two and a half or three years. So, so thank you, Jim and Alex so much. Um, and Fiona, again, um, just given how many demands you have on your time, it means so much that you joined and given the influence that you had on my own thinking, my view of the world. I just can't tell you what an honor uh, it was to engage with you, an honor to have your imprimatur on the book. Uh, thank you so much. And it's just, it's a real, real privilege to have this chance to talk with you today. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a real honor to be with everyone. I, I also want to commend Alex and Jim and everyone um, for uh, coming up with uh, this series. This is a really, uh, this is a, a really great framing exercise as well. And um, hopefully it will also lead to some changes. Uh, and the way that we think about things. So thank you. I think we did we just I think we might have just lost Alex. So um, if that's the case, uh, I, I, grateful to her for the partnership that she and I have developed uh, through this series with New America and with Bridging the Gap. Ali, congrats on the book. Fiona, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and with that, um, wish everyone a great day um, and happy reading.